Why can't we have nice things? Conflict resolution and information security. Hey everybody, good evening and welcome. I'm Rachel Leninger and I have about 10 years of experience in information security and risk management. Don't worry about writing down, there's a lot of references in this talk. There will be a handout at the end. You can get them from the purple guy. And um, I'm here to tell you why we can't have nice things. As a field, we are pretty notorious for having trouble getting along with business, with management, with technology, with ourselves. There's just a lot of conflict. With all of these problems, it can be easy to forget that conflict isn't necessarily bad. The opposite of conflict is not harmony. The opposite of conflict is groupthink and dumbass decisions. We don't need less conflict. We need less stupid conflict. So I've been going to cons for many years. And pretty much every con will have some version of this talk or several versions. I was never terribly happy with them. The story for why we had problems was a story. I was never sure if it really applied to everybody in the field. Was it really that we weren't empathetic enough, or that we weren't collaborative enough? Or was this just the personal pet peeve of the speaker? I didn't know. There was never any data. The other issue I had with these talks was that the answer pretty much always boiled down to have better social skills. Thanks, great. This is inarguable, but not really very actionable, at least for me. If I could have better social skills just by being told to have better social skills, I wouldn't have kept going to these talks. So instead, I went back to school. I got a master's degree in organizational leadership, or as I like to call it, remedial office politics. <laughs> I took... <laughs> I took a lot of classes in negotiation and conflict resolution, and I proved what I already knew. I sucked. <laughs> I wasn't, my professors were kind of baffled. I wasn't too aggressive. I wasn't too passive. I was just really stubborn. And I would end up with no deal, even on these really easy class role plays. And they're like, what? So there was something wrong with it. So I wondered was something in the way we as a field approach conflict causing our problems. And I did some research. I will get back to the question. First, let's lay the groundwork for the research. Oh, I skipped one. There we go. In dispute resolution, we frequently talk about negotiation styles. There are a bunch of different ways of approaching conflict. No one way of approaching them is better or worse than any other. The idea is that some are more appropriate to some situations and others to others. The skill comes in choosing the right way to approach a particular conflict. In the literature, these styles are conceptualized along two axes. We've got assertiveness, or how much you care for your own outcome, and cooperativeness, how much you care for the other party's outcome. If you're interested in an overview of conflict resolution, the different styles, and there's even a style test, the Bargaining for Advantage by Richard Schell is probably my favorite resource for that. So let's walk through the different styles. If you're both very assertive and very cooperative, you are using the collaborating style. This is the win-win style. If there is a best style, this is the one that people will pick. We often get called out as a field for not being collaborative enough. I do not think that this is the case, and I'll get to why later. Collaboration is great when you need good working relationships, when you need innovative solutions, and when you have plenty of time to work through it. Collaboration is less good when you don't have the time, the stakes are too low to be worth the effort, or you're dealing with really competitive people who will not collaborate back. If you're very assertive, but not very cooperative, that is the competing style. That's the win-lose style. The extreme version of this is Alec Baldwin and Glengarry Glenn Ross. If you have not seen that talk, look for it on YouTube because it is great. Competing gets a bad rap. It's Great when you need the results for sure. It's less great when you need to maintain a good relationship with people. Since most of our work involves maintaining a good relationship with people, we need to 
be careful when we use collaboration. When you're middling on both assertiveness and cooperativeness, <laughs> you're using the compromising style. That's the you win some, you lose some, it seems fair. Compromising is great when you don't have a lot of time or when you need to, or when the stakes are not high enough to be worth the effort of collaboration. It's not so great when this illusion of fairness makes you forget or somehow give away the really important thing. If you're collaborating, you're not finding innovative solutions. And whoever starts with the most extreme opening position in the collaboration will win. Compromising. Sorry, I said all the words so many times that they're all the same now. You know, you know the word I mean. It's on top right there, right? Okay. That's right. Yes. Do what I meant you to do, not what I actually tell you to do. So if you're neither assertive nor cooperative, you're avoiding. This can be a good idea. Sometimes the risk is too high, and you cannot risk losing that thing, whatever it is. Sometimes the stakes are so low that it's not even worth talking about. People think of diplomats as great negotiators. What the literature says is that they're actually often really great avoiders. Sometimes the only winning move is not to play. But sometimes you have to talk it out, and not negotiating at all can lead to miscommunication and resentment. Finally, if you are not at all assertive and you are very cooperative, you are using the accommodating style. This can be a good idea. When the relationship is the most important thing, when the thing that is at hand is just not an important issue to you, when you're wrong. However, Sometimes accommodating people can end up giving away the farm before they even know what it is. And if you're dealing with really competitive people, it can be a bad idea. So let's look at that research question again. How do the conflict resolution style preferences of information security personnel compare with the norms for the US workforce? The Thomas Kellen conflict mode indicator is a test for negotiation style. It's kind of corporate astrology. But there's about 40 years of research behind it. So it's well-known corporate astrology. Um, it's also normed against the US workforce, so I did not have to find a separate control group. Regardless, I expected to find nothing of any significance whatsoever, because most research does that. You just don't hear about it because it's not important, and who cares? However, to my surprise, my sample of information security professionals were special. I found that, in general, my sample was less accommodating than the norm for the US population. The median was at the 30th percentile. The mode where most of us landed was at the 16th percentile. There were, of course, some high accommodating people, but most of us just say no. What does it mean? It means we have a very short supply of one of the basic tools of negotiation. When all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you do not have a hammer at all, nothing looks like a nail. We do not use it even when it would be to our advantage to use it. We are just very stubborn. And we end up with no deal a lot. I didn't look into why we were like this. However, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, this is like all my friends, OK? <laughs> Our field requires us to say no a lot. People want to do things that aren't safe on networks and computers. I believe that our field may well select for people who are comfortable saying no over and over and over. It may also weed out the people who are not comfortable saying no or who just don't like working with people who say no over and over and over. Every other negotiation style was normal. Collaboration, competition, compromise, avoidance. All of them were 
similar to the normal population. Of course, different people would have varying degrees. Some of us are really skewed one way or the other, but it all came out on the wash, except for accommodation, which is where we were weird. <laughs> so if my research found that collaboration was normal, why do we frequently, constantly, get called out for not collaborating? My belief is that because we don't accommodate, we never signal a willingness to collaborate. One of the w basic ways you signal that willingness is to give in a little bit on something, anything. If we don't do that, then people don't realize that we would accommodate and they're not willing to even try because that can be dangerous and a waste of time. So what can we do about it? I'm not saying that we need to become accommodators. Let me repeat that. I am not saying that we need to become accommodators. What we need to do is be able to better socially influence people. We need to be able to use all of the tools at our disposal. However, socially influencing people sounds maybe manipulative, maybe a little evil. One of the reasons I am a low accommodator is I had this really strange idea that Trying to persuade somebody with anything other than my Vulcan logic was cheating. This is not correct, either scientifically or any other way. Emotion is actually really important to rational decision making. Um, the details are beyond the scope of this talk, but Descartes' Air by Antonio Damasio goes into the neuroscience in pretty good di detail. If you're completely rational, you're also not functional. You can't make up your mind on anything. Besides, would you rather be right or would you rather get things done? Being right and five bucks will get you a cup of coffee. Maybe. <laughs> this is Vegas. <laughs> Joel DeLuca's Political Savvy was how I did actually finally start learning office politics. It's a pretty great overview of how to get things done in an office without actually being evil. Unless you want to be evil and then, you know, go ahead. So what can we actually do to influence people better? Number one is look for concessions to make. We're always told to pick our battles. Let's start picking battles to lose. One of the reasons that I realized I was having trouble wasn't that I never actually accommodated things. It's that if I didn't care, I completely ignored it and gave it away for free. This is stupid. I smartened up. So let's stop doing that. I've seen it. other people do it. We need to pick which battles to lose if we can't find any bring the donuts. It works. And then there's donuts. When we do pick what battles we are trying to lose, we should also pick what battles we try to win. Over time, as the field changes, we have learned that many of our best practices actually do not help at all and hurt. So we should stop doing that. Do the research to find out if what you are advocating for actually improves the situation. One of my favorite papers in information security is Cormac Hurley's. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so long, and no thanks for the externalities. The Rational Rejection of Security Advice by Users. Everybody should read it. It is about how the advice we give users costs them more in time and effort than any benefit they actually get. It's not saying that security advice is useless. It's just that we need to be a lot more careful on what we insist on. Another thing that works really well is to admit when you're wrong. There's the expected effects from this, and then there's one more surprising effect. As expected, not admitting when you're wrong will backfire really badly when you are found out. And the chances that you were found out are, you know, really pretty high. It always happens, like, at the worst possible time. If you admit when you're wrong, people are more willing to listen to you because they know if you have screwed something up, you'll say, oh, my bad, and fix the situation. The surprising result, even though admitting you're wrong is really hard, if you just do it and move on, People forget. They completely forget that you were even wrong in the first place. There are people who seem to sincerely believe that I am right all the time. This is really awesome. I highly recommend this state. 
Another important tactic is to let people save face. Sometimes low accommodators, like me, will feel that even the illusion of accommodation is bad. If you give them an inch, they will take a mile. The problem with this is that people will forgive you for winning. They will not forgive you for making them look bad. So stop insisting they look bad if they're wrong about something. Interest-based negotiation is what most people mean when they talk about collaboration. Fisher, Urey, and Patton getting to yes is the pretty much the seminal work in the field. The idea is that you have interests, which is preventing bad guys from getting into your network. And you have positions, which, you, which is that you have, I don't know, a 90 million character password and whatever. Or maybe your interest is that passwords are encrypted in transit and your position is that they use FTPS to do it. Maybe they don't like FTPS. Maybe you don't care if they use Connect Direct or SFTP or HTTPS or IPSec or whatever, as long as it's encrypted. All these different possibilities that you can create by working with people's actual interests instead of these ironclad positions, it's called expanding the pie. However, once you've expanded the pie, it does help to have people with competitive skills to help divide it back up because creating all this extra value and then giving it all to the other party is also not bright. We forget that we are domain experts in a field that is difficult and counterintuitive for others. We can see patterns at a glance. They can't. They have to think it through laboriously and they will sometimes get it wrong. Any security solution that requires people to think something through is probably going to fail because we want them to react correctly all the time. Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow is about these different types of thought and how they work with people. Gary Klein's Power of Intuition is about how expert decision makers make decisions. Decision science often talks about, you know, how we rationally go through things and weigh the pros and cons. Gary Klein talks about how all his researchers said, no, that's not what happened. They do instant pattern mashing and pick seemingly by instinct or magic what's best. And that's because of the hundreds or thousands of hours that they've been learning something. And it's about how to get better about it, how to get better at teaching it. I wonder if we need to get better at teaching information security. Anyway, finally, my new favorite paper in information security is no one can hack my mind comparing expert and non-expert security practices. It compares expert and non-expert practices for staying safe online. They are very, very different. One of the interesting things I noticed is that all of the non-expert practices are our old requirements. They learned them. They're still doing them. They don't know why we're yelling at them um, for us. So let's understand what they're thinking and why they're thinking it, and use that when we try to change. I've been told that it is good to let other people think that they came up with an idea first. I had no clue how to do that. Motivational inter interviewing is an actual psychological technique to do that. It's intended to elicit the client's inner motivation for change. It's been used by psychologists, it's been taken up by coaches, it's been used by information security practitioners with good results. It's beyond the scope of this talk, but it's definitely worth looking into. And finally, I thought I would share how I learned better social skills for real. The problem wasn't that I didn't really know what to do. I sort of knew I could just never do it in the moment. In the moment, I wanted to say no, so I said no, which is not very socially skilled. Changing that, the most important things for me were a regular exercise habit and a regular meditation practice. Those things allowed me to take a step back and instead of my reflex no, I was able to do something else. I could look for concessions to make. I could bring donuts if I couldn't find any. I could do research into what the best practice for something actually was. I could look into what it would actually cost people to do what I was telling them to do as opposed, instead of assuming it was free. I could admit when I was wrong about something, or if I couldn't think of anything, I could ask them 
if I was wrong about something, because they will love to tell you that. I could make sure that I was letting them save face if I was winning on any point. I could try exploring interests instead of hammering on positions. I could remember that I was supposed to see patterns that they didn't necessarily see and explain the patterns if I needed to. I could learn what they were really thinking and doing. And I could try some stuff from motivational interviewing. Nothing I'm advocating is harmful because, again, I'm not saying we should accommodate on the important things. But I want you all to try it. Maybe you're not a low accommodator. Great. Try it anyway. Try it. See how it works. Tell me how it works. Complain to me if it goes horribly, horribly wrong because stories are great. I'm on Twitter. And it's just try these things because they are worth trying. And I know a lot of us just don't because I've been in the field 10 years and I've seen us not do it. Any questions? Yeah. So sometimes saying no is like but sometimes you have to say no and you have to show data and metrics because once you show data and metrics, it's, it's hard to argue with that. What are your thoughts on, you know, you can say no 90 times out of 100, but if you have data to back your, you know, no with, you will, I mean, it's nobody can argue with that. And if it's for the better, you know, if, if you are making your, if you're taking a customer, you know, perspective, you're making your, you know, customer data more secure or if it's in the best interest of the company and you back it up with data and metrics. Uh, you know, you could always win if you are right and the data backs you up. Can you help me understand the question? So what I'm asking is if I am always right and if I have the data to back my hypothesis or what I'm saying no about, is that still good or is that bad? Like, I can say no to, you know, something. To be honest, I have never met anyone who is always right. I have never met anyone who has metrics who can con that can convince anyone. And um, why, if you... Why is that? If I have data and if I have metrics and if the metrics strongly point to a direction that the company needs to take, why would someone argue with that? Well, I could say that the metrics are not good. <laughs> I'm stubborn. I have no, seen many, many is... bad metrics. No, but you know, I mean, the assumption The is... hypothetical perfect spherical metric... No, no, it's not hypothetical. You know, it's, the assumption is that the metrics is correct because if you can explain how you collected the metrics, what was your... I mean, it's hard to argue with numbers. So, no, so the assumption there is that people are data driven. Yep. That, that, that may be the case for a lot of us, but there's a whole world yeah, of people yeah. that the facts are not the driving factor of how they make decisions. But so then that's. No, no, but, but you're saying, but you're saying you are basically going against the data and saying the data says that this is good for your customers, but you will not make that decision because your people are not. There is an entire book that I mentioned in my talk, Descartes' Error, about why this does not actually work with people, with real people in real practice. And that is my data and my metrics for why that question does not help. Yeah. Well, once in a while you bump into a colleague that uh, honestly believes in flat earth uh, or something I'm not like sorry, it. I can't hear. Once in a while you bump into a colleague that uh, believes in the theory of flat earth or something like it, like a single node Hadoop cluster being a good idea. Um, how, like once you have exhausted any and all rational arguments and references to computer science texts and industry practices, uh, if the guy remains unconvinced, how do you handle that? I say, help me understand. And I keep the, why you are such a moron, in my inside voice. <laughs> you know, seriously, ask them. Ask them to explain it to you because you don't understand. This is putting the onus on you for not being smart enough. People with that kind of insistence like it when you're not smart enough to understand and they will explain it to you. And eventually you can get them to explain enough that either you realize they were right in the first place, in which case you admit you're wrong graciously and get magic points, or they start stuttering and they realize, oh, shh. And then you let them save face. Does that answer the question? Yeah. All right. One more question. 
So you dropped on us a bunch of different books and a lot of information that was really awesome, but you know, I, for one, have limited bandwidth. Where do I start? There's a handout that Mr. Purple Leader has. <laughs> Preparing in advance is helpful. That handout has a lot of the starting points that I would recommend. Are we all set? Awesome. Thank you.